Welcome to Unit 4, Probability, Random Variables, and Probability Distributions with AP Statistics. This video is going to tackle Topic 4.2, Estimating Probabilities Using Simulation. All right, we're going to start this video off with an example to help you understand what the heck a simulation is. So imagine that we're running an experiment, right? There are eight plots of land in a field, and we want to give four of the plots bush beans to see how they grow, and four plots pole beans to see how they grow. Now we are considering um, that we perform a completely randomized design. But if we do that, all four of one type of bean could end up next to the force, which would introduce a confounding variable. If I allow it to be completely random, there is, it's possible that one, three, five, and seven all get bush beans, two, four, six, eight all get pole beans. And then all of a sudden, maybe the bush beans grow because they're near the forest, and maybe they don't grow because they're near the forest. Uh, you know, that's kind of concerns me. So the question is, what is the probability of this actually happening, right? You know, let's just say that one, three, five, seven all did get picked to be the bush beans. That, to me, would be kind of like a pattern. That would be kind of weird. But I can't just say it's weird, right? The whole point of this entire unit is saying, don't worry about if it's a pattern or not, if it's random or not. Ask yourself the question, what's the probability of that happening? So now one way to understand probability is to actually perform the random selection many, many, many times and count how many times the outcome leads to all four plots next to the forest being of the same type, either all bush or all pole beans. Then divide that count by the total number of trials and we will have a proportion or a probability. So again, imagine if I were to simply do the random picking over and over and over and over again and actually count how many times one, three, five, seven are all picked to be either pole beans or bush beans. Well, that's what a simulation is. A simulation. This process is called a simulation, and the only way to have it work is to carry out, is to carry out multiple trials following a very clear directions. So what we're going to actually do here to try to answer the question, what's the probability all four plots next to the forest get the same type of bean, is we're going to run a simulation. We're going to pretend to do it with numbers, and we're going to see what actually is the probability that this happens. So a simulation is simply a way to model a random event. All right, so here are my very specific directions. I'm going to label each plot of land one through eight. Well, that was already done for me. I'm going to use a random number table. You could do a generator, but I'm going to use a table in this video. The first four numbers selected, ignoring repeats and numbers zero and nine, right? I, I need four different things to be picked. So if the same plot gets picked a second time, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm using numbers one through eight. That means zero and nine have to be skipped. I'm just going to ignore them if I see them. And the first four numbers picked will get bush beans. The remaining will get pole beans. Now, a trial will end once four different numbers have been selected. Because once four different numbers have been selected, the remaining plots are just going to get the other bean. All right, I will repeat this many times to simulate my trial. A successful trial is one that has 1, 3, 5, 7 all picked first. Because if 1, 3, 5, 7 all get picked first, they're all going to get the same treatment whether it be bush beans or pole beans, or if two, four, six, eight all get picked, because if two, four, six, eight all get picked, they all become bush beans. Well, then that leaves one, three, five, seven next to the forest, all being the other bean as well. So either one of those scenarios will allow all the beans next to the forest or all the plots next to the forest to be the same bean. So that's what I know a successful trial is. If any other outcome happens, well, that's not what I'm looking for, right? Any other outcome of numbers will put some bush beans near the forest and some not near the forest. And that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for all of the plots next to the forest to be the same. Now, at the end of my many trials, I will count how many successful trials I had, and I'll divide that by the total trials I ran. The result of this is an estimated probability of one type of bean being next to the forest. So again, part of a simulation is having very, very clear directions. You want to know what numbers you're going to use. You want to know what those numbers represent. You want to know how many trials you're going to run. I just said many. And you need to explain what a successful trial is because at the end, that's what you're going to do. You're going to count how many trials are successful. So you need to be very, very clear in what a successful trial is. So let's actually go ahead and put this simulation to use and try to do this. Now, I'm going to run five trials. You know what? If I ran more, you would just be getting bored. So trial one. Now, the whole point of random numbers is I can start anywhere I want. I'm going to start right here. 
All right. Eight, four, one. Uh oh. Eight. Got to skip it. Zero. Nobody has it. Got to skip it. Oh my gosh. Nine. Skip it. Nobody has it. And three. Okay. Eight, four, one, three. I'll write those down. Eight, four, one, three. They are all going to get bush beans. Well, that means that all of the same type will not be next to the forest. So if I go back to my picture, eight, four, one, three, eight, four, one, three, that will actually put two bush beans next to the forest and two not near the forest. So that is an unsuccessful trial. That was not what I was looking for. All right, trial two. And I'm just going to pick up right where I left off. Seven, nine, ignore, three, six, four, seven, three, six, four. All right, well, once again, those are not all next to the forest or all away from the forest. Seven, three, six, four, seven, three, six, four. Well, that's actually going to do what I kind of want. Two bush beans next to the forest, two bush beans not near the forest. But of course, it happened randomly. I didn't plan for that. All right, trial three, just pick up where we left off. Nine, ignore, nobody has it. Five, three, five, ignore, already got it. One, four, five, three, one, four, five, three, one, four. Oh boy, this was close. I almost had all the odds next to the forest get bush beans, but I did have an even snick in there. So once again, that's an unsuccessful trial. Trial four, T4. All right, seven, two, six, five. Seven, two, six, five. Okay, well, two of those are next to the forest, two of those are not. That's an unsuccessful trial. Let's keep going here. Three, five, eight, two. That's trial five, two. Oh, what were my numbers again? Sorry, three, five, eight, two. Three, five, eight, two. Well, once again, two of those are next to the forest, two of those are not. It's another unsuccessful trial. So if I were to stop now, I have zero successes out of five trials. So that's a probability of 0 0.00 or 0%. So at this point, if I were to stop, I would say, hey, looks like it is a 0% chance of getting all the same type of bean next to the forest. Well, I hope you do realize that this was just five trials. Five trials is not the end all be all to prove it. <clears throat> but I hope this example does show you exactly what a simulation is. I was trying to simulate, hey, what's the probability that all of them next to the forest get picked? And I only did five trials and it hasn't happened yet. All right. This idea is a simulated estimate versus true probability, right? So the relative frequency of an outcome or event, the percentage of times the outcome occurs over a set amount of trials, right? That's what relative frequency is. Relative is just a fancy word for proportion. Frequency is a fancy word for count. So it's the proportion of counts that we saw of an outcome or an event happen in a simulation. This could be used to estimate probability. Right? This is what we call empirical probability. It's an estimated probability through a simulation or through basically like, you know, practice, like real world application, trying it out, seeing what's going to happen. The idea here that I hope that you're understanding is that the true probability of an event or outcome would be the relative frequency of that outcome over an infinite number of trials, which we would call the long run. I mean, go back to our example. I only ran five trials and I came up with zero successes, zero out of five, zero percent. Well, if I really wanted to know the true probability of this happening, I would need to run like an infinite number of trials, right? Just keep running trials because eventually, I mean, eventually <coughs> it is bound to happen that you're going to get all of them next to the force pick. But I can tell you already, it's not going to be very likely. But there has to be a number besides zero, right? So that's the true probability. The true probability is only going to be reflected if I do a ton of trials and then count my successes versus the empirical probability or an estimated simulated probability is just a set number of trials. All right. So this idea spurns what we call the law of large numbers. Now, there's actually three different ways that you can interpret the law of large numbers, and I wrote them all down here. One option is that simulated probabilities tend to get closer to the true probability as the number of trials increases. So again, I only did five trials. That is by no means the true probability. But as the number of trials I do increases, I will get closer and closer to the true probability. Another way of looking at this is that the true probability of an event will reveal itself only after a large, large number of trials. After only doing five trials, there's no way the true answer is 0%. If I want the true answer to reveal itself, I need to do a large, large number of trials. 
And a third way of looking at this is that the more trials that you conduct, the closer you will get to finding the true probability of an event. So I said the same thing three times, and this is what we call the law of large numbers. The more times that you do the trials, the more um, likely that the true probability will come. So in contrast, if we only run a small amount of trials, we would not expect to get the true probability. In a small amount of trials, you're only going to get an estimated or an empirical probability. All right, so let's explore an example we already know the answer to. What's the probability of tossing a fair coin and it landing on heads? Okay, duh. We already know the answer to that. Everybody in this world should know the answer that the probability that you toss a fair coin and you get ahead is 50% or 0 0.50. Proportion, percent, either way, I don't care. So if I want to actually run a simulation, like let's just play dumb and let's pretend that I had no idea what the probability of flipping a coin and getting ahead is, or getting, excuse me, getting a tail is. One way I could do it is to literally flip a coin. Just take a coin and keep flipping it. And every time I'm going to record. And after 10 trials, maybe six of them are tails. Well, that's 60%. Well, 10 trials is not the long run. 10 trials is not a large amount, right? So maybe I do it for 100 trials. And after 100 trials, 55 of them were tails. Okay, well, that's still only 100 trials. So maybe I do 1,000 trials, 10,000 trials. The idea is that the true probability will come out after a large amount of trials. So tossing a coin could actually be done with tossing a coin. But another way that we could simulate tossing a coin is using numbers. So what we do is we'd assign the event tail the numbers 0 through 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's five numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those five numbers would represent a tail. And 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, those five numbers would represent a head. That way, five of them out of 10, 50%, will represent tail. And five out of 10 would represent a head. <clears throat> just like a coin has two sides, one side tail, one out of two, 50%, one side uh, head, one out of two, 50%. So then what I would actually do is I'd use a random number table and a trial will consist of looking at one number. I only need one number, right? The number will tell me either heads or tails. I don't have to ignore repeats because I'm only looking at one number. I don't have to ignore numbers that nobody has because I am literally using the only 10 single digit numbers in this world, zero through nine. I will run many, many trials, and a successful trial is one that has either a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, or a 4. So in the short run, I may not see 50% of trials be tails. It will actually fluctuate a little bit. Only in the long run will the true probability settle down near 50%. So if I go back to my number line here, and I say, you know, let's, let's do our tossing a coin example here. Um... Let's see here, I lost my mouse, there it is. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start with this row right here. So eight heads, unsuccessful. Two, successful. Four, successful. Four, successful. Eight, stop, that's not successful, that was the heads. So, so far I have three out of five. So three out of five is 60%. So, so far after five trials, 60% of the trials are a head, or I'm sorry, are a tail. Does that mean the true probability is 60%? No, I got to keep going, right? So I could pick it up. Seven, fail. Two, success. Four, success. Three, success. Zero, success. So, so far, after 10 trials, I now have seven successes out of 10. Well, now I'm at 70%. So like I said, in the short run, you're going to fluctuate a little bit. You might not get the exact answer. But if I look at many, 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 many trials, only then will the true probability eventually reveal itself. And I can actually see this, what's called a probability plot. A probability plot simply follows the probability of each trial. So maybe after five trials, we were at 60%. So you'd put a dot there. After 10 trials, uh, we were at 70%. And then, you know, let, you know I'm just going to kind of pretend here. But let's say after 20 trials, I was at, um, you know, 65%. And then again, it's going to fluctuate. It's going to go up. It might come down. It might shoot back up. But eventually, it might even come back down. Like maybe I go on a long string of getting a bunch of heads and at 40, I'm down here somewhere at 40% tails. But the idea is after a large number of trials, I should start to see the truth settle in at that perfect 50% mark. So in the short run, zero to 20 to 40 to even 60 trials, I might see some fluctuation in the probability of getting a head, or excuse me, I keep saying that, probability of getting a tail. 
But in the long run, after many, many, many trials, I should see the true probability flatten out at 50%. All right, so what have we learned so far? If you want to try to find the true probability of an event occurring, you need to just run a bunch of trials and see how many times it occurs and divide it by how many trials you did, but you got to do a whole bunch of trials. I mean, there's got to be an easier way, right? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, we can kind of, you know, we kind of would like to find the true probability of an event without running many, many trials because that wouldn't be fun. But so there are easier ways, right? There are much easier ways to find the probability of something happening without going through many, many trials. And that's, again, we're going to learn a lot of theorems, we're going to learn a lot of concepts, we're going to learn a lot of definitions, and all of that's going to help us understand all this. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to think logically. If you could think logically, then you don't actually need all these crazy definitions for probability, even though we are going to learn them. you got to be able to think logically. So here's an example. Right? Let's go back to the beans, right? So instead of running a simulation to figure it out, what is the actual probability of getting all of the beans next to the forest being the same? Let's actually try to walk through this, right? So, you know, if I want one to be picked, I got to think, you know, what's the probability one gets picked? Well, one eighth, right? There's eight plots that I could have picked. I needed one to get picked. And then I need three to be picked. Well, keep this in mind. Now there's only seven plots left because remember, I was ignoring numbers that have already come up. So now to get three picked, well, I need one out of seven because there's one plot that's number three and there's only seven plots that I could pick from. And then I need five to be picked. Well, once again, that's one out of six because now I've already picked two plots. There's six left, so one out of six. And then now I need seven to be picked. So that's one out of five. And then I'm just going to multiply these together because I need this to happen and then this and then this and then this. I need to pick a three and then I need to pick, a, um, I'm sorry, that first one was picking a one. And then I need to pick a, a three and then I need to pick a five and then I need to pick a seven. Okay, so let's kind of stop there. Going across the top is quite easy. One times one times one times one is one. And then across the bottom, eight times seven times six times five is 1,680. So I'm going to tell you already, that is possible, but that's pretty unlikely. But that's actually not the final probability. Because remember, I also could have had 2, 4, 6, or 8 get picked. Because if 2, 4, 6, or 8 get picked, and then all of a sudden, all of the, you know, then all of the ones next to the force would be the same because 2, 4, 6, 8 are all the same. So then I got to go through what's the probability of picking 2, 4, 6, 8. Well, that's actually something we already know. 1 eighth times 1 seventh for the 4 times 1 six for the 6 times one fifth for the eight. And again, that's one out of 1,680. So either one of these situations will work. So I would add them together. So, so far I have two out of 1,680. Remember when you add fractions, you keep a common denominator. So is that my answer? No, to be honest, because we went through picking one, three, five, seven. What's the probability I pick three then one, then five, then seven. Well, the good news is it's one out of 1,680. But that is technically a different order of picking things. So that would be different. But then I got to say, well, okay, what about picking five, then one, then three, then seven? And then we could sit here all day and say, well, what about picking seven and then one and then three and then five? So that is part of what we are going to learn is that it's very complicated to actually calculate probability when you start to think of all the different possible outcomes. And then for every possible outcome I think over here, I also got to think about the evens, right? Like we did two, then four, then six, then eight. But what about two, then six, then eight, then four? That technically is different. Now, the good news is the probability is still one out of 1,680. But man, there's a lot of different possibilities here. So that is why trying to actually find the probability of something happening, you know, mathematically could be a little bit tricky, but you have to be able to think logically. Now, through the, you know, through the whole unit, we are going to learn some shortcuts to help us with this, but I need you to understand it's difficult. It's not that easy. You got to be a logical thinker. So for right now, just understand that simulations could start to get us the answer, but only through a large, large number of trials will we actually find the answer of the true probability. All right, what we're going to take a look at next is a bunch of practice examples, understanding this idea of simulations to help us truly understand this topic. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this video now. So stay tuned to the next video 
for this topic that will show you some really specific examples to practice the skills we learned.